Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are studying the doctrines that are taught in 2 Nephi chapter 6 through 10. Now, the one that's speaking and giving this beautiful discourse is Jacob. He's the younger brother of Nephi. And as part of this reading assignment is chapter 9. And chapter 9 is one of the absolute greatest sermons on the atonement of Jesus Christ ever recorded. And it's thrilling to get into it uh, deeply today and take a close look at it. That's why I have pictured behind me here the empty tomb in Jerusalem. This is the traditional location of where the Savior was buried only for three days before he was resurrected as a glorified uh, being. And chapter 9 talks about what would have happened had he not risen, but more importantly, because he has risen, what blessing and benefit does that come into our life because the plan of our Heavenly Father has been completed through this perfect infinite atonement which he performed. And all of this talk of atonement makes me think of one of my favorite uh, stories from church history, which really outlines kind of in a parable way of how the atonement works. One person once told me that the atonement works by taking something that's not perfect and making it better. And I love that description. But check out this story from church history. It has to do with Joseph Smith when he's in Nauvoo. Now, when Joseph Smith is in Nauvoo, over those few years that he was there, he played a lot of different roles. He, prophet, president, seer, revelator, yes, all of those things. But he also had a lot of other responsibilities. And for a time, he was the judge. So he would go to where they held court. He'd put on the black robe and he'd sit and execute justice. Well, one day this man by the name of Anthony comes into court. Anthony had been accused of stealing money. The evidence was there. It was clear that Anthony had no defense and he didn't try to defend himself because he knew admittedly that he was guilty of stealing this money. Well, Judge Smith, the prophet who's acting as judge this day, he asks Anthony, why did you steal the money? Now, it's important to understand a little bit about Anthony. Anthony is an African-American and he explained to Judge Smith that his son is, although Anthony was a free man, here in America, it was the time of slavery. And so Anthony explained to Judge Smith that his son was not a free man, that he was a, just a child, but yet a slave in one of the southern states. Anthony was working so hard to do all that he could to, to earn enough money to purchase his son's freedom. Anthony's in a position in a situation which none of us will ever be able to relate to. But this was Anthony's situation. So Anthony told Judge Smith, when I saw the money, the temptation was just too great. And who wouldn't be tempted, not only tempted, but who wouldn't see that as an opportunity to advance their situation? Well, Judge Smith had complete compassion on this man, but he was the judge. He had to execute justice. Justice to breaking that particular law was one, Anthony had to give the money back, obviously, but two, it came with a penalty, meaning that Anthony had to pay a fine in addition to returning the money. So now he's not only back to where he started, but he's behind where he was originally before he committed that crime. He's in a bad situation, but that's justice, and Judge Smith had to make it so. Case was not dismissed, but the, the case was over because it was settled. Anthony, you got to give the money back and you owe this fine. Well, Anthony goes walking out of the courthouse and he starts walking down the street of Nauvoo. Joseph Smith, he takes off his judge robe and he starts walking out after Anthony. And now he's the prophet, acting as the prophet, right? And he calls out to Anthony. Anthony didn't want anything to do with Joseph Smith. He just keeps on walking. Joseph Smith, he yells out a little bit louder, a little bit stronger. Anthony, come back here. I want to talk to you. Reluctantly, Anthony comes back and faces the prophet Joseph. Joseph explains to Anthony, Anthony, you broke the law. I had to execute justice. Anthony, of course, admitted that he knew that that was the situation, although it didn't make him happy. Then Joseph says to Anthony, he says, you see that horse over there tied up? I want you to take that horse. I want you to take it into town and sell it. That horse will get a fine amount of money. Take the money from the sale of the horse, pay the fine. 
use the remaining balance from the cell of the horse to purchase your son's freedom. Anthony uncontrollably became emotional, threw his arms around the prophet Joseph. When both of them could finally speak, Anthony couldn't do anything other than just thank Joseph over and over again for his mercy in extending an opportunity for Anthony's terrible plight to be, to be over. I see this as a, a, a symbolic or as a parable of the atonement. Justice had to be executed. The law had to be fulfilled. Yes. But at the same time, the one who administered the justice then turned around and offered perfect mercy. And I think this is the key that we often overlook in, the, in what the atonement is. The atonement doesn't only make things the way they were before the sin or transgression or heartache or trouble or whatever it is, but it puts us in an even better position than we were in prior to desperately needing the atonement, as it was with Anthony. His fine, the justice, was settled, and yet the mercy gave back more than what justice required. And that's the beauty of the atonement of Jesus Christ. It always gives more than is necessary to satisfy. And so like my friend said, it takes anything that's not perfect and makes it better. Well, let's get into chapter nine. I'm gonna go a little out of order. I'm gonna go chapter nine, chapter 10, and then I'm gonna go back to those nice chapters on Isaiah six, seven, and eight. So a little, when we look at the Book of Mormon chronologically out of order, doctrinally, it doesn't really matter. So let's go with chapter nine that talks about the atonement of Jesus Christ. And as I do so, I wanna begin with a quote from uh, Tad Collister. Uh, he once served as a member of the Quorum of the Seventy, later as president of the General Sunday School, but he's written this incredible book called The Infinite Atonement. And a quote from that book is this, no matter how lost the world at large may be, no matter how deprived or degenerate it may become, there is yet a bright light of hope for those individuals who have a faith in Christ. Those who focus on him and his atoning sacrifice who let these glorious truths rest in their minds continually, will find that Christ's power to lift the human soul transcends even the weightiest burdens the world may thrust upon them. There is a certain spiritual buoyancy that attends a study of and reflection upon the atonement. I believe this is exactly what happened to Enos. Enos experienced what Brother Callister was ex explaining. For in the book of Enos, he starts out by saying this. You'll remember Enos is the one who prayed all day and night for forgiveness of his sins. Then he prayed for the Nephites. Then he prayed for his enemies, the Lamanites. But before he tells all that story, he introduces this experience by saying this. Behold, I went to hunt beasts in the forest. And the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. Who was Enos's father? Jacob. And so when Jacob or Enos went and had this incredible experience that we're so familiar with, it was because he was familiar first with 2 Nephi chapter 9. Now, how does that, knowing that, seeing that connection, does that not increase 2 Nephi chapter 9 in our level of importantness, of, of worthy of our attention? It most certainly does, because as Elder uh, Brother Callister says, those who focus on him and his atoning sacrifice, who let these glorious truths rest in their minds continually, will find that Christ's power to lift the human soul transcends even the weightiest burdens. There's certain spiritual buoyancy that attends a study of and reflection upon the atonement, as it was with Enos, because now in verse 4 he says, And my soul hungered, after thinking about the words of Jacob, his father, And my soul hungered, 
And I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for my own soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him. Yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice unto him that it reached the heavens. Well, in a future video here in a few weeks, we're going to get really deep into the book of Venus. So I won't spoil it too much. But it was Second Nephi chapter 9 and the other words of his father Jacob that really put Enos in a position to experience such a miraculous transformation, spiritual transformation. Well, let's get uh, now into it then, like, uh, like Enos did. So in chapter, five, or, uh, chapter 9, starting in verse 5, about halfway down. For it behooveth the great Creator that he suffereth himself. So now we're going to be talking about the atonement, okay? So the atonement is comprised of the Savior suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, the hanging on the cross, the dying on the cross, being placed in the tomb, this tomb, and then being resurrected on the third day. Those events all put together comprise what we refer to as the events that, that created or, or made available, made available the atonement to each one of us. So why, why, did he, why, why did he want to do it? For it behooveth the great creator that he suffereth himself to become subject unto man in the flesh and die for all men, that all men might become subject unto him. There's this great quote that has everything to do with what we're talking about by Elder Melvin J. Ballard. And he talks about this very thing. Why would it behooveth or why would it please the great creator that he would go and suffer. Well, Jacob gives us the clue there that, that if he does that, then all of us might be able, in that way, come unto the Savior. But Elder Ballard says it this way. He explained why it pleased God, particularly not to interfere with this. In that hour, I think I can see our dear Father. So in that hour when those events began, those tremendously difficult events, began for the Savior. It would be so difficult that even a God, whom Jesus Christ is, would need the comforting and support of an angel sent to him by his loving Father in heaven. Elder Ballard, in that hour I think I can see our dear Father behind the veil, looking upon these dying struggles, until even he could not endure it any longer. And like the mother who bids farewell to her dying child has to be taken out of the room so as not to look upon the last struggles, so he bowed his head and hid in some part of his universe, his great heart almost breaking for the love that he had for his son. Oh, in that moment when he might have saved his son, I thank him and praise him that he did not fail us. For he had not only the love of his son in mind, but he also had love for us. I rejoice that he did not interfere and that his love for us made it possible for him to endure to look upon the sufferings of his son and give him finally to us, our Savior and our Redeemer. Without him, without his sacrifice, we would have remained and we would never have come glorified to his presence. And so this is what it cost in part for our Father in heaven to give the gift of his son unto men. Elder Ballard must have been a genius when it comes to the doctrine found in chapter 9 of 2 Nephi. For in that quote, he, he summarizes everything that jo Jacob teaches here. It makes me think, of course, that quote and the doctrine found in this chapter of John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And in verse 8, Oh, the wisdom of God, His mercy, and His grace. So in chapter 9, the first, the opening verses, it talks about the, rich, the righteous, and it talks about the non-righteous, or the wicked. And he talks about the state of both of them. The righteous get all these good things, and they wait until the resurrection, and they're brought into the presence of God, and it's awesome, it's great, and it's grand, and it's something to look forward to. And the wicked... They're not in such a great situation. And so he paints this picture of, well, of reality of, what, of, of what's going to happen after an individual dies based on are they righteous or are they wicked? 
And in verse 17, because of this situation, there's righteous and there's wicked, we all come back into the presence of our Heavenly Father. Oh, the greatness and the justice of our God, for he executeth all his words, and they have gone forth out of his mouth, and his law must be fulfilled. So now regardless, so we talked about, okay, here's the state of the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay, now everybody, probably individually though, they come before the Father to be judged. And what does the Father have to do? What must he do? Execute justice. Just like Judge Smith in Nauvoo had to execute the law. And so it says there in 17, Oh, the greatness and justice of our God, for he executeth the law. But fortunately, because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, we then come to verse 19. Oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God and the Holy One of Israel. So we have a need for justice, but there's a necessity for mercy. And here in verse 17 and 19, when we bring it together, those two doctrines taught in each of those verses, we find that all the, all the greatness and goodness, the wisdom of God, His mercy and grace, is that He found a way to satisfy justice while extending mercy. And it's because Jesus Christ is at the center of this plan and made it possible. In verse 21, it tells us just that. And he, meaning the Savior, cometh into the world that he may save all men, if they will hearken unto his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men women, and children who belong to the family of Adam. Now, I emphasize that word, that they will, he will save all men if. So here we're learning about the Father's role, the Savior's role, and now we're about to learn our role in this great plan of our Heavenly Father. One of the other words that we've got to understand before we discover our plan, or, or our part in the plan, is that word in verse 21, hearken. So this all works. This justice being satisfied by mercy, it all works if we as individuals will hearken unto him. So what in the word world does hearken mean? Does it just mean listen? I can just listen to what the Savior's saying? No, actually. When we look up the definition of the word hearken, we find that it means to attend, to regard, to give heed to what is uttered, and to observe or obey. So when the Savior says that the mercy, mercy works if we will har excuse me, if we will hearken to him, he's asking us to do something. It's an action. Hearken isn't just listening. Hearken means to hear with the intent to do. And so what do, we, what do we do? What's our part? We find that in verses 18 and 23. I won't read all of the verse, but just some of it. Some of our, the things that we must do. They who have believed in the Holy One of Israel. So we have to have faith. And they who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it. And then in verse 23, they must repent, be baptized in his name, have perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel. And when the Father does his part, did his, does his part, because the Savior did his part, if we will do our part, then we too will exclaim, as Jacob does, Oh, how great the holiness of our God. And that will be something wonderful to exclaim. Not all, I made that sound like it was a future tense. We can exclaim that today. As we do our very best in those things that the Savior's asked us to do, we can finish off the day and re review, reflect, repent if necessary, and then climb into bed saying, you know what? Man, oh, how great the holiness of our God. We, we ought to say that every single day. 
In addition to these things as outlined in verse 18 and 23, there's one more thing that we've got to do, and that is found in verse 39. So in chapter 9, verse 39, the very last line is this counsel, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. So how do we succeed in our part of the plan? By staying focused, spiritually minded, doing the things that will bring us closer to our Savior. But if we look at that counsel, spiritually minded is life eternal. We take the first letter of each word, S-M-I-L-E, smile. And so what must we do to be a part of this great plan? Smile. Because when we're smiling, it indicates that we're happy. Or smiling comes as a result of being happy. And the plan of our Heavenly Father is the plan of happiness. So when we are doing our part, it's going to make us happy, which results in us smiling. And so if we're smiling, we're doing pretty good. Spiritually minded is life eternal. And then we get to the invitation. The Savior always gives us an invitation. And this is it in verse 41 and part of 42. And then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. Why is there no servant there? Because he is there. He doesn't pass this off to anybody. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. And whoso knocketh to him will he open. As we somewhat start to conclude here on the atonement before we go to the rest of the, this week's assignment, reading assignment, all of this makes me think of one of my favorite sacrament hymns. And of course I'm not going to sing it to you. But I will read the lyrics. It says, There is a green hill far away, without a city wall, where our dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. We may not know, we cannot tell, what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved, and we must love him too, and trust in his redeeming blood, and try his works to do. Near the end of this chapter, verse 52, last sentence, after teaching this great sermon, giving out warnings, giving out invitations, giving out doctrine, Jacob concludes with this, let your hearts rejoice. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to the atonement is our testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. See, if you have a testimony of the first vision that Joseph Smith had, if you really believe that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw, in that God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to the prophet jo jo or the boy Joseph, if you really believe that, then by default, you have to not only believe in the atonement, but you have to accept it. It's a package deal. You can't believe in the first vision and then not fully accept the atonement of Jesus Christ. Because if what happened, and I know it did happen, if what happened did, then Jesus Christ as a resurrected being stood in front of Joseph. It means he lives. It means he left this tomb and returned to his father. And because he left this tomb and returned to his father, that means the atonement was completed. That means it's a perfect, infinite atonement. So we might say, yes, I believe in the, in the first vision experience. I really do believe that Joseph Smith was called to be a prophet of God, that God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him. You might say that and believe it and have a testimony of it, and that's proper, that's what you should. But there is a little comma there in that testimony where we need to add in. And because I know these things, I know that the atonement of Jesus Christ is real. Because Jesus Christ was standing there. 
And then the third step is because he was there and because that means the atonement was completed, we then have an obligation to accept his invitation to be changed forever because of the blessings of the atonement. So when Jacob calls it an infinite atonement, what exactly does that mean? Infinite in what? Here's a couple of suggestions. And as I make these suggestions, I'd like you to make this connection that if these things are infinite, if this is what an infinite atonement provides, and by step through, I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet, I now have an obligation, a responsibility to accept these qualities of an infinite atonement, which include, but is certainly not listed to this very short list, it's infinite in time. Nothing is too far in the past to reconcile with the Lord. His, and nothing is too far in the future to allow the atonement to prepare, make, make, and mold us to become. It's infinite in depth. There's no one or no thing that's too far beyond the grasp of the atonement of Jesus Christ. We could describe the next uh, definition here that I came up with, and that is reach. Perhaps we, know, I, we understand the depth because I just described it, but maybe it's the reach. Maybe no one is beyond reach. No, he's a respecter of all persons. It doesn't matter if you're old or young. In fact, Jacob lists all men, all women, all children, everyone that belongs to the family of Adam qualifies for the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's an infinite reach. Or what about scope? An infinite reach in scope, or not reach in scope, but an infinite in scope. There's nothing that the atonement can't do. Like my friend said, the atonement fixes anything that's not perfect and makes it better. Anything. There's nothing that can't be touched by the atonement. What about infinite in comfort? Now, this is where we start having to accept that the atonement is personal and it's for us and it's available for us because of our testimony, as I previously explained. So infinite in comfort. There's no comfort that the atonement can't provide, which then trickles out a huge long list of things that it does satisfy. Broken heartaches, despair, depression, timidness, shyness. Maybe those are the same thing. Being scared, uneasy, uncomfortable. All of these negative things, all these things that are not perfect, he can make better. Similarly, infinite in healing. There is no sin that is so great it can't be overcome through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you might throw a comment on the video, which is just fine, and say, well, what about those sons of perdition? Okay, the sons of perdition excluded because they choose not to accept the atonement of Jesus Christ. Not because the atonement of Jesus Christ can't rescue them, because it can, but they are in that state because they choose not to allow the atonement of Jesus Christ. Same could be said for the adversary and his followers. Could the atonement of Jesus Christ fix it all? Yes. But they, in other situations, choose not to allow that to happen. What about uh, infinite in understanding? Infinite in Jesus Christ knowing the exact situation you're going through. And you say, well, he didn't lock his keys in his car when he was late for a dentist appointment. Yeah, he didn't. But you look at the things that he did do during his mortal journey, and maybe they were kind of bigger deals than locking your keys in the car when you're late for your dentist appointment. So he might not understand losing his keys to the car he didn't have to go to a dentist that didn't exist. But he was in very similar situations in which he does have compassion on that situation teaching this concept to a deacon's quorum once. And I said, come up with something in your life that you think Jesus Christ doesn't understand. And I should have used this example instead of the dentist one that I just had off, you know, just popped off in my head or whatever. But they, they, said, they said, he doesn't know what it's like to have his car break down. And I said, yeah, you're right, he doesn't. And he does know what it's like to walk everywhere. And he does know what it's like to be the king of kings, and yet when he has a ride, it's on the back of a donkey. So does he understand? Yeah, he does. 
So he's perfect. And the atonement is infinite in that understanding. Those are a couple of silly examples. There's more, there's millions of other examples that can be proven that, yeah, he does get that. He understands exactly the situation you're in. So he doesn't just feel sorry for the situation you're in but and have compassion, but he also takes it the greatest, greatest step further and can say, I know how you feel because I have felt that same way. And think of when you go to somebody, you say, man, I've had such a crummy day. This happened and that happened. And somebody says, oh, man, that sounds pretty horrible. Man, you did have a bad day. Compared to going to somebody and saying that same thing, they say, you know what? Man, I have been there too. I had a day exactly like that. I know how you feel. Now, which one brings you more comfort and mend your heart a little faster? The Savior does that every single time, infinitely. He knows every situation. He can't come up with a situation that he doesn't get. I want to jump back into chapter 9 here, back to verse 25 and 26. Jacob makes a very brief commentary that, hey, this, this is all applicable to everybody who knows and understands and gets this stuff. The people who are watching this video and all the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and even more than that. What about the people who don't have access or never did have access to the Book of Mormon or General Conference or a living prophet for the understanding that even there was a Jesus Christ? What about them? And Jacob gives that just in two verses, that brief commentary that, hey, they're going to be okay too. Because the Savior's going to, atonement is infinite enough in reach, in depth, in understanding to bring in all of those people as well. So I'll give you a story from church history that teaches this. Joseph Smith's oldest brother, Alvin. Alvin was older than Hiram. And Alvin was Joseph's everything. He was his best friend. He was his mentor. He looked up to this guy. He, Joseph Smith, his hero was his older brother, Alvin. Joseph Smith, in September of 1823, was visited by the angel Moroni. And nearby hill, hill is deposited on gold plates a record which contains the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ as de declared by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent, he says. And so Joseph goes to the hill. He pulls back the rock. He looks in. Sure enough, there's the record. He goes home without the record, and he tells his family. Now, it's interesting to me that the people who knew Joseph Smith the best believed him the most. Because when he came home empty-handed, he said, uh, you remember before I went on that walk down to that big hill, you know, two and a half miles down the road, and I told you that this angel came and appeared to me, and he told me that there's a record, and I'm going to get it, and, and all, you know, I've got this great work that God's going to have me do. Well, I, I went and I saw the record, but I, I didn't bring it home. I don't have it. I can't show it to you. And how did they respond? We believe you, Joseph. Like I said, those who knew him best believed him the most. They all believed him. I said, yeah, you don't have them in your hands, but Joseph, we totally believe you that an angel came. We totally believe you that you saw the plates, and one day you're going to do a great and marvelous work among the children of men for our loving Heavenly Father. They were all in, especially his oldest brother, Alvin. He was all in. And in um, Mother Smith's journal talks about how she uses the word zealous, that Alvin was the most zealous of all the family members in regards to this work. So this is September 1823. Alvin dies in November 1823, about 45 days after Moroni came and visited Joseph Smith. He dies. So he, uh, just before he dies, like the night before he dies kind of thing, he's on his deathbed. He invites each of his siblings in to give him kind of this final charge and instructions before he, he passes away. So Joseph Smith comes in, he tells him this, quote, I want you to be a good boy and do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instruction and in keeping every commandment that is given you. Did Alvin believe that the record existed? Yes. Did he believe the testimony of his little brother that the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ was contained on those, on those plates? Yes. So before the Book of Mormon was even published, before even a single symbol was translated into the English language, Alvin had a testimony that it was true. So Alvin passes away. The minister tells the family, Alvin's in hell. You're never going to see him again. 
And that's all they had to believe and know for 13 years until the Kirtland Temple was built. Joseph, Hiram, Father Smith are all in the upstairs office of the Kirtland Temple, and a vision opens up that Joseph Smith sees. It's recorded as section 137. The heavens were opened upon us, and I beheld the celestial kingdom of God, and the glory thereof, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. I saw the transcendent beauty of the gate through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, which was like unto circling flames of fire, also the blazing throne of God whereon was seated the Father and the Son. I saw the beautiful streets of that kingdom, which had the appearance of being paved with gold. I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father and my mother and my brother that had long since slept. And I marveled how it was that he had obtained an inheritance in the kingdom, seeing that he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time and had not been baptized for the remission of sins. Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of, my, of this gospel, who would have received it had they been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also, all those who shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to their desires of their hearts. And I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. And that's the end of the vision, as it's recorded in section 137. So as Jacob teaches it, we now see just a few years ago, really, that this story from church history reiterates and proves again just how merciful the great plan of our Heavenly Father truly is. Then we get into chapter 10. Now, chapter 9 teaches us the great plan of our Heavenly Father. We need to read it over and over again. We need to study it. We need to know that thing as Elder Callister or Brother Callister invited us to do. Because, and, and as we come to understand chapter 9, we then get to understand chapter 10 a little bit better because in chapter 10, Jacob reminds us that the plan doesn't just magically happen. So I think this is really one discourse that's going on. He teaches everything that we've gone through, and then he says, you know what? It just doesn't, poof, happen. There's a little more to it than that. And he tells us what the little more to, to it than that is in verse 23. Therefore, cheer up your hearts and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Agency is still a part of the plan. And one of the things that we must do is choose to follow the Savior and to make that choice of discipleship every single day. In verse 24, he tells us how, how to choose to follow him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil in the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. We have to reconcile ourselves. What in the world does reconcile mean? Fortunately, from my online dictionary, I found the answer to that. To reconcile means to call back into union and friendship the affections which have been alienated or to restore friendship. So how do we reconcile ourselves in that way? We do it by accepting his invitation. Come, follow me. Come unto me as he continually begs and pleads. Now let's jump back to the beginning of the reading assignment. We've got to go through chapter six, seven, and eight, and they are full of some really awesome doctrinal things. So Let's turn in the Book of Mormon to those chapters now. So as we start into chapter 6, we find Jacob is going to start quoting Isaiah. Now, Jacob, he's a pretty nice guy here. He's, he reads Isaiah differently than his brother is going to do it later, Nephi. Nephi, a little bit later in 2 Nephi, he's just going to give us Isaiah. Here, Jacob, though, he reads a little bit of Isaiah. He slows down. He gives some commentary. He helps us understand he kind of puts the pieces together for us. It's almost as though he's training us how to read Isaiah 
so that when we get later in the book of Second Nephi, and we've got a bunch of Isaiah to read, we're kind of in the groove and, and uh, we're ready to go and, and learn and, and, and become educated and everything with it. And he doesn't just start into teaching us Isaiah either um, or even explaining it, but he first tells us why. The words of Isaiah are so important. He says this, chapter 6, verse 4, I will read unto you the words of Isaiah, and they are the words which my brother had desired that I should speak unto you. So Nephi is putting his big stamp of approval on these words and saying, Jacob, love what you're teaching, but include this stuff from Isaiah. It's so important. We've, they've got to have it. And then in the next sentence, and I speak unto you for your sakes. It's not for entertainment purposes or to become whatever, but it's just purely the words of Isaiah is for our sakes, for us to learn. Because everything Isaiah does, he teaches and points towards the Savior. He doesn't talk about anything else. It's all about Jesus Christ and learning of him. Now, he'll talk about other things that point towards Jesus Christ. But at the end of it, Isaiah only speaks and testifies of Jesus Christ. And then later in verse 5, Jacob says, Speaking of these words of Isaiah, they may be likened unto you. And so that's what we've got to do. We've got to look through this and say, okay, where do, how do we find ourselves in these words? What do they mean for us? They're so important. What am I going to do with it, with this new information that we glean from Isaiah? So let's keep all those things in mind as we go ahead and get started. So we find in the uh, here in the last, last verse, or the last sentence of verse 12, and for this cause... The prophet has written these things, the prophet being Isaiah, because they're important. They bring us closer to Christ. So because even us thousands of years later can liken these words to our own daily lives. All right. Jacob explains further. Uh, or excuse me, let me back up. <clears throat> he goes uh, verse seven is kind of where we start in with Isaiah. And kings shall be their, thy fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Remember with Isaiah, it's all symbolically. We don't have these the king of whatever coming and licking people's feet. It's all symbolically. And as I said, it all everything points towards the Savior. So what are we actually talking about? Jacob explains in verse 13, what verse 7 means. Wherefore, they that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord shall lick up the dust of their feet, and the people of the Lord shall not be ashamed. For the people of the Lord are they who wait for him, for they shall wait for the coming of the Messiah. And then in verse 14, he talks about an event that happens in conjunction with the second coming. In verse 15, he lists out some of those signs uh, not signs, but actual things that are happening uh, that precede the second coming, such as fire, tempest, earthquakes, bloodshed, pestilence, famine, etc. So he starts going through those. And as he's painting this picture of everything that we just learned in 7, 13, 14, and 15, he then gets to the verse of hope that, hey, this is a kind of a crazy picture that we're looking at, but it's going to be okay if... Let's read what all that is. In 17, But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. And then here we go. For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. So who is the Lord going to save? His covenant people. Does that mean that the people that are on the covenant path and moving down the covenant path are somehow going to not feel the earthquake? or not be affected by a pestilence, or not be affected by a volcano or a typhoon or whatever it is? Not necessarily. Remember, when the Lord makes a promise, He's looking much longer term than any of us can even comprehend. So when we look at trying to get to the, to the weekend after a long, hard day of work, you know, we're, very, we're short-sighted on that. If we're looking, hey, until, until we pass away, until we pass to the other side, I want to do these things and accomplish, you know, whatever that are, you know, we always put time frames and timelines in, in our lives, not the Lord. When the blessing is pronounced, it might come in this life. It might come in the next life. Remember, the Lord is always thinking eternally. 
It's just like President Nelson has asked us to do. Think celestial. So yeah, how's this going to, um, what blessing might I obtain tomorrow or next week or 10 years from now by doing this thing? That, those questions are fine and dandy to ask, and they should be asked. But in addition to those questions, how will my actions today um, affect me in the next life as well? And I'm going to make those decisions with that longer term perspective. And the decision that I make and the way that I approach making that decision, I'm going to do so by thinking celestial. So this is what President Nelson is asking us to do. So as we read in verse 17, for the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. He's thinking celestial here. He's not thinking how to avoid the fire and the, and the pestilence. So thinking celestial. So as we look at chapter six, and that's kind of all I'm going to talk about chapter six because it bleeds right into chapter seven. We get more explanation about these few verses that I've read in six as we go to Jacob's commentary in chapter seven. I really think this is one general conference talk, chapter six and seven and a little bit of eight even. And so we've got to read it or we've got to study it in that way. So everything that we've just talked about in chapter six, now let's go to chapter seven and in verse one. So 17, okay, and this is kind of the pivotal point where we're making the bridge between the two chapters. So forgive me for reading it again, but in 17, after reading about all the, all the stuff that's going to go on negatively, 17, for the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. And then let's go to verse one of chapter seven. Yea, for thus saith the Lord, have I put thee away? Who's he talking to? The covenant people. Have I put thee away or have I cast thee off forever? For thus saith the Lord. Why would you think that? Why would you think that I've cast you off forever? I mean, really, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? To whom have I put thee away? Or to which of my creditors have I sold you? The answer is none of them. You haven't done any of that, Lord. But he continues talking. Yea, to whom have I sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. So he's likening himself here to divorcement and mother and its child of the Lord and the covenant people, because the Lord and the covenant people have that sort of a bonding relationship as a husband and a wife or a mother and a child. So his imagery here is by no mistake, perfect. Of course it's perfect because he's perfect. But the imagery for us, we're looking at it and we're like, okay, well, yeah, we're understanding that. And so he's saying to the, to the covenant people, I was going to put a number on, but I won't, to the covenant people who feel that separation from the Lord, the Lord's saying, hold on a second. I haven't walked away from you. I haven't created this separation. In fact, in verse 2, when I came, there was nobody. I called and there was no answer. Come follow me. Come and partake. Come and be with me. Come unto me is the plea. But even though he pleads and begs and invites, we have to take the action and we have to choose the Savior. Continuing all this thought, we get to verse 4 through 11. And we learn in verses 4 through 11 that we must continue to learn. We must continue down the covenant path. I've said in a video before, and it's important to make this comment again, that the covenant path is not the ordinance path. Sometimes we mix that up and think, well, the covenant path, well, I've been baptized, I've received to get to the Holy Ghost, I've gone through the temple, I'm married in the temple, you know, the whole thing. I'm, I'm out of ordinances. There's nothing left for me to do. I guess I'm at the end of the covenant path. No, you're at the end of the ordinance path. There's a difference. And so verses 4 through 11 teaches that we must continue down that covenant path, doing the very best that we can. And he will help us, as promised, in in, through those sets of, of verses, a couple of uh, highlights of those promises. For the Lord will help me. The Lord is near. And then again, as if we didn't hear it the first time, the Lord will help me. Has got to be our battle cry. It's got to be. And then we get down to verse 11 after, after these reminders. And here comes the warning. The Lord, just side commentary, he always invites us, 
The invitation comes with a promised blessing and a warning. Isn't that awesome? The Lord says, I'll invite you to do this. You can choose. And it's not just choosing not, well, let me say it this way. He, he gives us an invitation, and then he invites us to choose. And he also tells us the result. You choose this way, you get this. You choose that way, you get that. I mean, it's like the most awesome math test in the world, where the teacher says, here's the math problem. You can choose this for the answer, and you'll pass the class. Or you can choose this for the answer, but you'll fail the math class. The choice is yours. You want to pass the math or fail the math. And depending on what you want, pick that answer. That's all the Lord's saying. Man, he makes this so simple. It's, it truly is simple. So the invitation, then the blessing. We've been through all that. Now we get to the warning. And the warning is in verse 11. Behold, all ye that kindle fire, that compass yourself about with sparks. Remember, this is Isaiah speaking. So we've got to start thinking, okay, imagery here. What's he, what's he talking about? Behold, all ye that kindle fire, that compass yourself about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks which you have kindled. This shall you have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. Why would we lie down in sorrow for making this, um, by making this fire and whatnot? Well, we find that out. Um, I'm jumping ahead of myself, excuse me. You come to your own conclusion. You define it yourself. Uh, because it's Isaiah, liken it to yourself. I'm myself, you're yourself. Read that verse and think about it. Here's the way I read that verse. Behold, all ye that kindle fire. Remember, this is the warning now. That come, comp compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire. And you'll lie down in sorrow. So what's got to be the opposite? If we don't want the sorrow, we want the happiness. Then we've got to do the opposite of what brings sorrow. Walking in the light of our own spark brings sorrow. So happiness must come from walking in his light, the light of Jesus Christ, choosing to be in his light. And if we choose to walk by his light, the promises made in the preceding verses become a reality. Let me read the three of them to you again. For the Lord God will help me. The Lord is near. And then again, the Lord will help me. It also makes me think of Lehi's vision of the tree of life. Some people, they're walking it along, hanging on to the rod. Everything's going great. And then the mist of darkness comes. And they try to forge the path on their own and they get lost. Others, the mist of darkness comes. They start hearing people talk, making fun of them, murmuring. And they wander off and listen to those voices. The imagery, in my mind, of that is just the opposite of walking by the Lord's light. The tree of life must have been glowing, must have been beautiful. And if we're looking at His light and walking towards it, then we avoid getting lost in the midst of darkness or succumbing to the chattering from people who are distracting us. The point being that we must hold tight, continually pressing forward towards his light, that pure light. We do that by trusting in the Lord. Then we get to chapter 8. Here comes some blessings. So chapter 8 is continuing on this big old great general conference talk by Jacob. So he's giving us the blessings that are coming, and now he's going to list out a bunch more. In verse 6, he says, but my salvation shall be forever. Verse 11, and they shall obtain gladness and joy. Those who cling to his light. His covenant people who cling to his light, don't get distracted, follow him, accept his invitation to come closer to him, invite him into our lives. They shall obtain gladness and joy. I am he who comforteth you, those who choose that path. And then 24 comes another wonderful promise. Awake, awake. Or excuse me, not a wonderful promise. A wonderful invitation. Again, another invitation. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. 
put on thy beautiful garments. What does that mean? Joseph Smith was wondering the very same thing. If we go to section 113 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord and others have asked the, the excuse me, Joseph Smith and others have asked the Lord for some interpretation of these verses of, of Isaiah. And so they ask. In fact, it's a man by the name of Elias Higby. It's his question. He says, and you can find it in section 113, starting in verse 7, Elder Higby's question, or Brother Higby's question, what is meant by the command in Isaiah, put on thy strength, O Zion, and what people had Isaiah reference to? Okay, so that's what we're reading. Put on thy strength, O Zion. He says, what is the strength and who are the people? The Lord responds in verse 8 of that section. He, meaning Isaiah, had reference to those whom God should call in the last days, who should hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel. And to put on her strength is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage, also to return to that power which she had lost. So awake and put on the power of the priesthood. He's asking the covenant people to do. Remember the word awake. Awake means to excite from a state resembling sleep, stupidity, or inaction. So when the Lord says awake, he's saying to the covenant people, let's get to work. We've got a great and marvelous work to to do, come and join me. Come and join the ranks. Who will join the Lord? Who? And he's inviting us by saying, you, let's, let's go to action. And how do we do it? By first putting on the power of the priesthood. Let me make a brief commentary before we wrap this up. From President Nelson, he gave this quote in a recent general conference. We see faithful women who understand the power inherent in their callings and in their endowment and other temple ordinances. These women know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen their husbands, their children, and others they love. These are spiritually strong women who lead, teach, and minister fearlessly in their callings with the power and authority of God. How thankful I am for them. In three verses, President Nelson uses the word power three times. That's pretty frequent. So when Isaiah says awake or get up and get doing something and put on the power of the priesthood, he's speaking to everybody. Every person who has chosen to be one of the covenant people of the Lord. So now that we've got this army who's ready to go, ready to act, and they're armed with priesthood power to do the Lord's work, what are they going to do? Everything we've been talking about in chapters 6, 7, and 8. They are going to gather Israel. And that takes us back to the very beginning of this discussion. Chapter 6, verse 7. The one that sounded like really weird and crazy. Now it can make perfect, beautiful sense. The imagery that Isaiah is seeing of the gathering of Israel and the way he's describing it. He's just describing the gathering of Israel. Who's going to do it? Those who choose to be on and stay on and get down the covenant path. Those who are willing to act and do instead of just talk and sit. And they're going to do it not under their own experience, power, knowledge, whatever, but with the power of God. And with that, how can any of us lose? We can't. We certainly can't. And so that's why the promise comes in verse 17, because it's a no loss battle, no losing battle. Anyway, that's Second Nephi chapter 6 through 10. Super awesome stuff. And I hope that you enjoy it as you read it and study it. And don't forget, make the study of Second Nephi chapter 9 
part of your regular routine study. Don't wait till you get to the end of the Book of Mormon, start over, and then get to it. Read it once, then read the other 531 pages before getting back to it. As Elder Callister said, boy, as soon as we start to learn and understand the atonement more and more and more, the greater and greater and greater the blessings of it come into our lives. And all these things I say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.